Hello and welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we are going to sit down with Scott Johnson and Bill Fain, founding partners of Johnson Fain in Los Angeles, California. They are going to discuss the 25-year transformation of Oklahoma City oil field number one into the first Americans Museum, which honors the state's 39 tribes. Architect and urban designer Bill Fain, F-A-I-A, directs master planning and urban design at Johnson Fain. He has won several national AIA and Progressive Architecture Awards for projects including Mission Bay in San Francisco, Beijing's Central Business District, and the Greenways Plan. For Los Angeles, Bill has received two fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts and Humanities and was the recipient of a Rome Prize Fellowship at the American Academy in Rome, Italy. He has a bachelor's degree of architecture from UC Berkeley and a master's architecture in urban design from Harvard Graduate School of Design. Firm partner and creative lead Scott Johnson, FAIA, has designed nearly 100 built projects in the past 20 years. Further, he has taught and lectured at various universities, including directing the Masters of Architecture program at the University of Southern California School of Architecture. Scott is the author of Essays on the Tall Building and the City, Formative Skyscraper, Tall Building Design. Now, the big idea, critically and practice uh, in contemporary architecture, tall building, imagining the skyscraper and tectonics of place, the architecture of Johnson fame. He holds a BA in architecture from UC Berkeley and a master's degree in architecture from Harvard Graduate School of Design. Bill and Scott met at Harvard Graduate School of Design in 1987. They acquired renowned Los Angeles firm Pereira Associates, rebranding at Johnson Fame. These two gentlemen have accomplished quite a bit in the architectural world uh, based in Los Angeles and have done some very significant things. And it's very much a privilege to have them both on the podcast today to talk about their first Americans museum design and how they did it incorporating uh, a lot of first American advisors uh, that helped them put this together. So it's going to be a pretty interesting conversation. Enjoy. I ran through a whole uh, intro already for both yourself and Scott and kind of a, a, um, a foundational uh, introduction to the project and why, why we're talking, what we're talking about. And this project uh, has a lot of interest for me specifically to talk to the designers about because uh, a, a lot to do with the, the, the different culture of uh, the Native Americans, First Americans that uh, a, a design firm has had to try and process the different way of looking at the world and a different way of being and turn that into a design. Um, that, that to me is kind of the very real crux of, of interest here, but I'd love to go through first kind of your own personal background and your educational background, the firm background, and then kind of the story of this project, if you could. So I was uh, educated here in California at the University of California of Berkeley uh, during the 60s, which was a fairly turbulent time. It was certainly a lot of social issues were being expressed and discussed uh, uh, throughout the campus. And uh, uh, and so it influenced me, at least uh, from a standpoint of a culture and uh, and societal issues. Um, I uh, I worked as an architect uh, doing buildings uh, for the first uh, couple of years, and then uh, I became very interested in community planning and urban design. And uh, a very important event happened for me personally was uh, I went to the University of Cal uh, uh, University of Manchester in England and learned great deal about uh, uh, English and French new towns. I became very interested in uh, city planning. And English and French new towns? Yeah. Well, they had uh, two different systems, of course. But uh, but during that year, the French had, had developed a regional planning system, which was really uh, very, interested, uh, very interesting from the standpoint of, of various new towns and expanded towns. Anyway, it became a very, very important uh, sort of seminal event for me personally. And uh, I became more interested in urban design and less in buildings. And uh, interestingly, uh, uh, the, uh, I had a chance to work for the mayor of New York, which is uh, John Lindsay during those times and work in the urban design group there and did some of the zoning and uh, the 
did some transportation planning and that sort of thing, uh, which were very, very important. Later, uh, after that, I went to Harvard Graduate School of Design. And um, uh, similar to Scott, we uh, w both went to Berkeley at different times, but uh, in, uh, at, uh, 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 in graduate school, we actually took the same courses and uh, collaborated uh, on the planning and design of Boston, the city of Boston. So oh. we st struck up a friendship. Um, and then later, uh, I had to, uh, for very personal reasons, had to, to move back to Los Angeles uh, and did so. Uh, but was fortunate to uh, uh, interview with uh, William Pereira, who is a, a fairly sig significant architect here in Southern California. And uh, now, it, yeah. for for your personal interest, why uh, why the gravi why the why gravitate towards urban planning rather than specific building design? What was it in you personally that that drew you that direction? Well, uh, good question. I think uh, uh, I think it was uh, primarily uh, a an interest in trying to be able to influence uh, the environment. And uh, one thing I learned in working uh, in the Bay Area, <clears throat> pardon me, for an architect uh, uh, architectural firm, uh, we ended up uh, designing buildings uh, which had already been programmed and decisions had already been established. So the uh, opportunity to actually begin to influence and through public policy and, and, uh, uh, and through uh, really determining program become, became really essential. And mm -hmm. how, it, how it bears on this American Indian project was that uh, we were hired very early on uh, to enter the process. So we were able to, uh, to uh, be good listeners and to uh, begin to formulate a program that actually translated into uh, a sort of meaningful expression uh, of the Native American condition. And, mm. and Oklahoma, quite frankly, is a very uh, unusual uh, situation because it was Indian territory up until 1907 when Oklahoma became a state. So mm. uh, uh, it was uh, the repository of many Indians, uh, American, uh, uh, original Americans, uh, Native Americans, uh, because of the 1830 Act. Now, in... In working at a, uh, a a deeper, more influential level, where you might not have the exact recognition as you would with an architect having their name on on the building somehow, but rather as a uh, urban designer, uh, what what are the what what is the uh, kind of truth for you or the philosophy that drives uh, the the rationale to work in an urban planning setting rather than a single building? What is it that you're trying to communicate philosophically through the decisions that you make as an urban planner, the, the, the ways that that space communicates? What's the deeper philosophy for you that, um, that, that watches over that decision-making process and the values that, that you install through, through making the design decision? Uh, well, I think it is an urban designer, then uh, clearly uh, <clears throat> our designs are, <clears throat> excuse me, are bigger than a single building. So it's a collection of buildings and the spaces that they create between. And they, those are those are things that are very important. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in some ways, the, the American Indian project uh, reflected as that sort of attitude, uh, uh, their concept of earth and land, the difference between the two is very different. Earth being more community driven and as a part of a larger collection of people rather than a single building, which is a statement about uh, an individual. So in a way, urban design really fit well to the programming of this, uh, this facility and actually the conceptualization of its uh, of its, uh, its, its, uh, its form, um, because of that. And, now, uh, I can explain a little bit about their attitude towards 
earth and land, uh, which is a very different attitude than us Western Europeans on the way right. we look at uh, land. Now, the, the idea of coming at this with a, uh, the tip of the spear for that culture is much more, or the, in general, the, more, the native cultures was much more community oriented. It, I, I think that's a fair observation where the more Western cultures seem to be highly individualistic and, and linear where the, the uh, more first people's cultures tend to be uh, more circular, spiral, and community-oriented. And what, what is the, the, the value of each type of approach, uh, but also the downside of those approaches that you have to mitigate in doing both things? Well, uh, the, uh, it's a very good question, because fundamentally, uh, we reward those that uh, that can respond quickly and and uh, to uh, that to produce things in a very linear way. I mean that's the way we're trained in our academic uh, ways of looking at the world. Uh, Native worlds look at it differently. They try to take it into all factors, so they're very right. uh, consensus driven, and they also uh, they they looked for signs uh, about uh, the the truth. And they, uh, they, they look at it much more holistically. Uh, the reality is it takes time. And, you know, this mm. project took 25 years. So <laughs> it's, it's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit of a, the story of, of the, uh, the Indians, uh, the, uh, I like to call them the indigenous people, the, the native people of our country. And uh, they, um, they it, it does reflect the process of the building uh, over all these years really, really reflected much of what what the native condition is. Um, uh, now, the pluses and minuses are interesting, though. The plus is that you, you, you confront issues and you do it quickly and you move on. Um, mm. You know, native cultures, that they, they try to take everything into account. And there's a kind of mm. wis a wisdom in that, actually. So it's a very important. Yeah. Uh, I, I taught uh, high school for two years in uh, the Marshall Islands, which uh, for the most part is a completely uh, indigenous culture. Um, but there, there's, you know, there's that culture contrast when you go there from the very, you know, linear, uh, straight ahead, uh, must accomplish, much, must achieve, must get as much done today as possible kind of culture of America to running into this culture that um, ran itself more on the rhythm of, of nature than we got to get stuff done now. And it's got, you know, it, it was a very interesting, um, it was a very interesting transition into existing in, in that way at their schedule yeah. for two years and everyone would refer to it and they would too as just Marshallese time where the you know they'd say we're going to get together for a dinner tonight uh starting at seven but it wouldn't start till like 11 and it would go till <laughs> like two or three in the morning and that's on a weekday but the amount of uh, life and community that came together that interacted in the net that they have between each other is a much different and much more aware thing within that community than than we possess in this culture from from living in both and it allows for a lot more time for you to just understand yourself and the people you're with when you're around that and that that idea uh or that way of functioning within a society and the longer time that it takes there's all these things that we can look at as negatives but when you when you have to live through it for that amount of time, you start to see the things that come out of that that are actually benefits. The more of the ability to see potential long term effects of changes, but you still have to get a community like you're saying, a community consensus on board, which you know to to think in that way of seven generations, how's this going to affect that kind of thinking? Uh, you know, it must be a real pain in the butt for some things. But the payoff is is a much longer and, you know, possibly much more accurate to our true nature um, result, I would imagine. 
Yeah, I think you've nailed it. Uh, uh, you're speaking of the the Confederacy of the Iroquois, uh, that is mm. uh, thinking ahead for seven generations. And oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Your, your, your experience is very interesting because we too, uh, early on in our uh, forming this firm, we did a project in the Hawaiian Islands and had a very similar experience to to what you, you just referenced. And uh, you mentioned nature and and the the sort of the corollary, the way it works is that circularity really uh, represents nature in so many ways. Uh, the changing of the seasons, uh, the moon, uh, the sun, the morning, the evening, uh, all, uh, and then the reoccurrence of it again, it comes upon itself again. So it's, natu it's, it's natural to think that native cultures have taken this into account. Um, uh, I think it's, again, the Western linear thinking is something that we, uh, uh, or our forefathers uh, uh, invented or came up with uh, many, many mm. generations ago, uh, which is much more linear and gets us to a, a conclusion much sooner. And it's not necessarily right. right. And your point is well made is that the, um, that the, uh, the holistic nature of the native condition is, it takes many things into account and it takes time to do that. And right. quite frankly, quite frankly, that this, this project in Oklahoma that we're speaking towards is, uh, it reflects that kind of uh, education. We as linear thinkers had to change and we had, we needed time to be able to understand that. Hmm. And the plan, the plan reflects it, the circularity. There's hmm. basically, there's basically two circles, they cross each other. One is an earthen circle, which is uh, related to uh, it being at the location of a river. I mean, native cultures built upon earthen mounds. And mm -hmm. uh, so we, we were in a floodplain on the project and we had to build above the floodplain. <laughs> and uh, so that's the earthen circle, which is a spiral mound. It begins in the earth, it goes to the a promontory point overlooking the river. And it's, it's a walk of life, really, uh, the procession of life. And it's a native, oh. uh, it's a natural uh, uh, world. Uh, the, now, can I ask you a, a quick question about sure. that, that earthen mound that's in the design yeah. uh, that reflects yeah. the, uh, the cycle of life? It, on one side, it seems to start fairly low, and on the other yes. side, it, it, it ascends, but then drops yeah. off pretty quickly. Is that yes. representational of birth to death? Well, it's yes, it's it, well, it's it's interpreted in many ways, but uh, very interestingly, uh, we learned at least at the outset that uh, it should it represents a procession of life, mm -hmm. uh, and you begin in the earth and you ascend to heaven. Uh, many of the Plains Indians buried their uh, their dead on scaffolding or uh, uh, above. Uh, on the bluff overlooking the river. Um, and then the, mm. the birds would come down, feed on the bodies and they'd ascend to heaven. So it's a, a kind of an idea about origin and uh, future, uh, past and future. So, but that's very much natural. And at the center of the, of the, of the spiral mound, uh, the, uh, the equinoxes uh, or the solstice are commemorated by uh, by a passageway that goes through the, the mound and during the sunset uh, at uh, uh, at uh, the winter solstice, uh, the 21st of December, the light comes through the the passageway to the center of the circle. Interesting and similar uh, the during the summer solstice, it sets on the uh, peak of the, the mound. The equinoxes are also uh, commemorated, particularly the sunrise uh, uh, on the equinox uh, from the east. And mm. the, the entrance to the museum is uh, on the eastern side of the circle, the great circle, and much in the way the chief would have his teepee on the eastern side, and the opening to the teepee would be oriented towards the rising sun on the equinox. So it's a, all these, these sort of uh, these indicators 
of nature are embedded in, into the plan of this. The two circles. So the, yeah, the two the circles. The chief are has really... to wake up first and doesn't get to sleep in, essentially, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's maybe the case, <laughs> being the leader of the tribe, right? <laughs> yeah, it's no rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's a good. Uh, the the two circles are really important because uh, if we have the earthen circle, which is uh, commemorates nature, uh, mm -hmm. then or the natural condition, then the the other circle is the building circle, which uh, it loops and it crosses over the other circle, and that circle represents technology, man made. Um, Another way of looking at it could be that that's the Western way of, of creating th things. And then the mm. more native way is the, uh, is the circle of the mountain. Now they cross and where they cross is they form a very unusual uh, elliptical uh, type space. And it's 110 feet high. It's the height of the mound. And uh, it, uh, it, it forms the hall of the people. It's, or we call it the Hall of Reconciliation, which is uh, the reconciliation of the two histories, man and nature, native and uh, 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 settler. Um, and it's the Hall of all people, uh, which is really important. The Indian were very interested in having a, uh, a place where uh, people could be, uh, who could celebrate life uh, together. and. Uh, so I thought uh, this is this is very much a part of the the plan making for this, uh, and it forms the structure. It's a very basic, a very simple diagram, and uh, it uh, it is open to all people. I've uh, I've been watching a lot of stuff on on uh, different ancient uh, structures that that are you know archaeologically being studied. And it seems like all the really ancient structures had a uh, a strong tie to uh, stars, sky, sun, moon, uh, equinoxes, solstices, everything else. And and it's very interesting to me that you've incorporated that into this. Um, and the the thing that stands out to me so sharply for for my thinking is this idea of um, you know we almost term it. Uh, as a pejorative, but a way of circular thinking, uh, we can kind of say, "Well, that's circular thinking. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get anywhere." We want to think more linearly, or more lin is that a word? Linear, linearly, linear, <laughs> linearly, yeah, Linear, literal. Um, <laughs> Good. Go ahead. Literal. We want to think more literal and linear, linearly, um, which is highly advantageous to getting singularly your own will done which can be a great thing but you have to you have to recognize that connection to a community that you're a part of a net with and i think within uh western thinking that's the thing that gets us in trouble a lot is that we uh easily disregard that we're not all connected pretty much and that thinking of this more indigenous culture in this circular way um and it's interesting Two, the, this is one of my questions that I had for you. The, the, the concept that they had that right angles would uh, trap the soul, not contain it, not limit it or anything else, but in some way trap the soul. How much, how much um, thought and, and research or understanding went into that uh, in putting this together? Well, um, we... Uh, uh, the 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 problem we won't be able to get away from right angles uh, because buildings yeah. need, need certain efficiencies but we do if you look at the form of the of the structure it's very much uh, curvilinear and mm -hmm. uh, it uh, it does take into account uh, this sort of nonlinear linear uh, uh, approach to things so it's not really simple going from a to b it's very much more complex um, this, this kind of thinking was, uh, very much a part of a lesson that Don Fixico, who was our advisor during this process, amazing, uh, a hundred percent native, uh, uh, American. And, he, uh, he, 
became sort of the quiet uh, but stern uh, teacher to to us as we began this process. And hmm. so I think it's uh, it took a while to be able to do it. Uh, we used the time well um, uh, in terms of our own uh, enlightenment. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, we were reasonably good listeners. We tried our best uh, in listening to uh, the native voices. Uh, and uh, the process was very, very much a, a, a iterative process, uh, exploring alternatives, uh, lots of research. We spent uh, a, a year, year and a half on research just to understand the, the indicators and, and numbers and things that were important to the native condition. And they are embedded in the design of the building. Uh, in the Hall of the People, for example, there are 10 columns. Why are the 10 columns? Because numbers mean something. And uh, because of the 1830 uh, Indian Removal Act uh, passed in Congress, it stipulated that the Indians are to be marched 10 miles a day from their native origin to Oklahoma. Mm. Uh, this was the beginning of a, uh, a transition uh, of, of of, of taking earth and moving it into the definition of land, meaning that the mm. Western, the Western, or our country and uh, the Western mind wanted to commoditize land and be able to, to allocate it to people as owners. Whereas right. the nat natives thought of it as, as something much greater than that. They considered earth. And so, I mean, these lessons were very important to us all and understanding the native condition and, you know, and so I, you know, and, and, it's, and touring the site after they, we opened, and we opened in uh, the museum in uh, 2021, I personally was very satisfied to see that, that it was uh, really being owned by the Indians. They occupy the, the project, they run the project, uh, they use the project for cultural events, and uh, it's uh, a great satisfaction for us all to to see that uh, happening. So, yeah. Um, what what is the um, what is the with 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 trying to understand how a people would relate to you know what <laughs> what could be viewed as an occupying force in their land what right. is the relationship to to having to to now work within a different structure of organization of that that came over their land i mean i, I don't know how else I would be able to look at it if I was of native descent that I would feel like this system, just like a virus is a bad name, but it, you know, it, it took over and there's, there's just no stopping it. You have to like, well, can't beat them, got to join them kind of thing. And now this, our, you know, Western culture is trying to learn from this now occupied land, the things that we trampled over. What is the, what is the, disposition of relationship between the native peoples and and the rest of the country from your interaction with it what is what is the condition of that relationship and what is what is the experience of the people as far as you can tell well i i think uh the western european linear mind is not going to change <laughs> no, I, and, and yeah. I don't I don't necessarily think it should or shouldn't. I think you have to look at the linear mind has benefits. It also oh, yeah. has some real negatives. The circular more way of thinking is going to have benefits and it's going to have negatives. And the two of those can learn can best learn from each other and find that middle ground where they, they both come together more. And hopefully this kind of project is something that outlines these ways of doing things that can join together to make an actually better thing long term. Yeah, well, I think the, you know, t uh, t time is a really important factor here because if you think environmentally and our what we're facing in the earth and 
and uh, the consumption of resources that our current way of, of dealing with life, uh, it's going to be really difficult to to manage and change that. But nevertheless, um, the, the circular thinking, um, I think it, it does open up a great deal of opportunities for us to understand that we need to plan uh, for greater futures, longer distances, and, and make decisions that are less uh, immediate. And uh, uh, let's see, I would say efficient in, in some ways. Um, and I think uh, it's interesting, uh, on the Native side, uh, the, the, the Native peoples have adapted quite well. Uh, well, let's say it's been difficult for them to embrace these linear thinking. There's no doubt about it. And I think that, uh, but they do adapt. Uh, they have adapted. And uh, many of the tribes have done quite well uh, uh, for various industries and in the Chickasaws, uh, yes, they do have uh, gambling, but they 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 employ uh, uh, tens of thousands of people, and they have uh, multiple industries that they've they've developed. Now, this has been uh, embracing the linear thinking uh, to some extent. Do you see? Mm. So, yeah. in some yeah. ways, they they've also adapted uh, a very. Uh, I'd say that because of essentially survival. I mean, one of their major themes of the importance of, of uh, the museum, because it outlines a number of, of themes, uh, this being uh, in particular uh, a theme that uh, they, uh, they don't have a theme of conquer. They have a theme of survival. And so they've mm -hmm. been able to survive and adapt. Adaptation is mm -hmm. another theme. So, yeah, so, it's and they don't, they, they, yeah, they, the, they don't uh, see their, excuse me, they don't see their, their situation as, as being tragic. Um, uh, one of the struggles we had in developing this is, is that one of the compelling stories is about the Trail of Tears, which mm -hmm. this, this facility em, uh, embodies. Um, but they don't see it as a, a tragedy. They see it as a, a condition that they had to adapt to and survive from. So... Hmm. Um, and I think that in some ways, us Western thinkers, we, we want to confront these issues of tragedy to understand. Uh, yeah. So we don't make the same mistakes in the future. Uh, you know, one, our, our exhibit designer we brought in was, uh, was Ralph Applebaum, who did the Holocaust in uh, museum uh, exhibits in Washington, D.C. So Extremely uh, powerful. Very powerful. But this is, this is not a single line uh, uh, a progression uh, as it was there. Uh, it's much more multivalent, mm -hmm. multivalent. Mm -hmm. So it's a. Uh, um, uh, so I think there's there is a great deal of optimism that's uh, embedded in this this project, and you sense it when you're there. There's also uh, a great deal of opportunity for interpretation, and th this is directly coming from the native people. So we're very hopeful that, that, uh, that uh, we all, or the visitors will understand uh, some of the important references that are uh, made. Uh, the, the thing that I'm, I'm realizing is the, from, from just my you know, limited interaction of, that I have of reading mm -hmm. about this project and viewing the images and then talking to you is that the, the culture that you uh, worked for in designing and producing this uh, thinks of themselves uh, in terms of we, where we think of ourselves in terms of I. And when right. we think of ourselves in terms of I, time becomes now, not yes. future. And if we yes. think of we, there there's a presentness to that way of thinking, but you have far more... Uh, the idea of the the cycle of things rather than the thing that you can accomplish right now you if you think in terms of we you're thinking m more so what part am i going to play in we rather than what am i going to accomplish for me that's a that's a for me a very interesting takeaway from from just interacting with this at the level i've been able to interact with it i definitely hope someday i can uh, can go 
and and see this museum with my family i think it's a very important thing for us to realize as as you know members of this nation now to to realize you know the the foundational ways of life that were here before this current culture emerged on this land and uh to the things that we can learn from it to to improve our the the, co the cohesiveness of our entire culture even between these uh polarized ways of being that we're that we're currently in so uh thank you for for walking me through this from from your very unique perspective kind of the overall uh urban design uh, approach of this, the the solar uh, orientation, and uh, more of the mythological and cultural things that were brought into this are are very interesting to interact with. Um, again, anyone who's uh, watching or listening to this, the the first Americans Museum is in Oklahoma. That's correct. In uh, what what is what town is it near? In no, it's, it's it's Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City. It's, okay. Yeah, it's in, it's uh, it's part of the downtown uh, redevelopment uh, area, and it's uh, right. Uh, it's on the uh, uh, the Oklahoma River, which is uh, 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 a major river. It's it's also called the North Canadian, which goes north into mm -hmm. uh, other states. Uh, it's uh, quite a long river, and uh, it does flood. <laughs> and, <laughs> Which is uh, something that uh, that we uh, anticipated. I might say it's also uh, was uh, drilling site number one in Oklahoma City, uh, Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma. And uh, the idea is that the uh, it was originally of, uh, of the uh, native people. Uh, I wouldn't say owned, but uh, they possessed it, and. Uh, then it was taken from them. The minerals were extracted uh, and it was contaminated. And now it's given back to the Indians. And they are currently, uh, well, they've, 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 re they've restored the purity of the land. They've cleaned it up and uh, they're continuing to do so. And they won a couple of awards for that. It's interesting, um, national awards. So for the uh, restoration of the site. <laughs> so they're they're coming in and cleaning up after some very linear ways of doing yeah. things. Well said. <laughs> well said. Yeah. The, I yeah. mean there's there's progress to be made, there's uh, mistakes to be known about and changed for future situations. Yeah. It's a it's a whole it's a whole thing that uh, that uh, hopefully we can we can figure this out. <laughs> You but, know, one uh, thing you yeah. one thing you mentioned is this uh, is the issue of we versus I, and mm. it's really important. You're right on right on it. You're right on the mark. And uh, the creation of this uh, project was incredibly uh, a collaborative. Um, I think we as designers were reaching for something we really. Uh, didn't know where it was going. Uh, it was this idea of what you've said, the linear versus the circular thinking. And uh, because of that, uh, and because we had our own distinct roles, we supported each other, uh, whether it was George Hargraves, who was known for large earth forms, a landscape architect, who was department chair of Harvard at the time, or Ralph Applebaum with his a deeply embedded research process, or Don Fixico, who's as uh, our advisor. Uh, we also had uh, we had on our team uh, Rick Carter, who was Steven Spielberg's production designer and has two Academy Awards, Avatar and Lincoln. Oh, wow. uh, and, and he was a part of the collaborative process. Uh, and then over time, uh, we had a number of very talented designers internally in our office who understood the, the nature of this project. And uh, of course, myself and then Scott, we collaborated, collaborated on this as well. Um, and the workshops were very exciting. You would have loved them. <laughs> and, I, I uh, love that kind of thing to see the process yeah, is, is really yeah. interesting. 
Yeah, and I think you're you're right on. It, it was a very creative process, and we had workshops both in Oklahoma with uh, Native people as well as um, uh, in Los Angeles in our studios here in, uh, in Hollywood. So Great. Well, William, Bill, Fane, thank you so much for taking the time to kind of walk us through uh, intellectually through this project and the design process and the relationship of the process, which is, which is uh, so important. Uh, really appreciate your time. And uh, now we're going to speak with uh, Scott. <laughs> I'm so bad with names. Yeah, Scott Johnson. Johnson. Scott yeah. Johnson. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, I that's great. Well, to that name. <laughs> yeah, thank right. you. Thank you for allowing us to be with you. Thanks so much. All right, so let's welcome uh, Scott Johnson now to the second half of the conversation. So, architect Scott Johnson of Johnson Fain Architects, or just Johnson Fain. Well, Johnson okay. Fain, but but we are architects. It's all true. There, that's all true. Good. Okay, so uh, Scott Johnson, you are more in in what has been from the outside at least a very successful partnership uh between your yourself and uh William Fain uh it seems like you've been able to balance yourselves in that partnership where one individual's a little bit more drawn to the urban planning while the other's a little bit more drawn to the actual design of buildings is that is that a fair balance in that partnership yeah i think that that's right i'm uh Architecture is a thing I like to do. Architecture, interior design, make, making things. Uh, and Bill has always been, in some ways, more conceptual and interested in mm. larger projects. Um, uh, the intellectual process and the research is a bit different than in architecture for us. Yeah, I, I was actually part of a architectural uh, partnership right out of school, myself and Caleb Johnson. And we the thing I found is that we both wanted to do too much of the same thing and it made too much <laughs> conflict within our relationship. Now we're back to just being good friends rather than business partners, which is more beneficial in my opinion. So yeah, yeah, good, good strategy. The fact is the fields overlap, but you have to be oh, yeah. thoughtful about, you know, where the borders are or where one person is more passionate or informed in that area and, and you're more in that area. So you're in some ways you're always negotiating the borders, but um, right. it's been very good for us. What a uh, quick side question to, to get there. I mean, for what, what advice would you have uh, in that you are part of a successful partnership? What is the top three things of advice for anyone considering the, you know, highly unlikely to be, uh, successful uh, venture of going into a business partnership. They're always, always difficult and you've made it succeed. What are, what are the three things that you can pull away from that that's actually contributed to, to your success as Johnson Fink? Well, I think you, you have to share kind of the same, the same values in general. You, you have to want the same thing. You have to define success, small s, in the same way. Um, and then as we were just discussing, number two, you have to decide <clears throat> what is each party partner's strengths so that you're complementary and you're not competing over the same thing and you're not sending out mixed messages. That needs to be clear. <clears throat> and then I would say thirdly, you have to build a culture. If, if, if the thing has le legs and it's going to work <clears throat> over some period of time, you can't just be, uh, you know, Superman, Superwoman every second. And it's all about you. You have to build a culture of support where people understand you're articulating the vision um, and you're they're always doing that. Um, and you, know, you know how the things are made, but you're sharing, you're growing, you're teaching, you're mentoring so that people are coming up. And as you get more work and it gets more complicated or maybe more diverse, um, they're able to track together with you into those things. And they're and you're, you're all becoming kind of of one mind. So I think those are probably the three things. Trent. I love hearing uh, information from experience. That's always a, uh, it's, you're, not, you're not sharing with me the sum of a math problem. You're looking up <laughs> and to the left and, and pulling from history of, of your experience and like 
here's here's the advice from history that it's just a different kind of information than like in 1793 this happened and you know so for to get to know you a little before we understand how you played a part in relating to this very different than a uh, highly westernized culture you had to take your background and who you are and uh, marry it in many ways to this other culture to be able to produce something that reflects them but also through the conduit of your own history your own uh, very westernized way of thinking how did you join those together uh, eventually we'll get to that but uh, first and foremost what formed you as a human what are the real things that uh, guide your thinking and the boundaries that you kind of stay within uh, just in understanding your own personality and, and what contributed to making you have foundational ways of thinking that guide your decision making. Tell us about Scott Johnson, essentially. Well, um, so like most architects, I've been to school for a long time. So there's a kind of the academic thread and, you know, that layers on information as you were just saying, I'm not sure it lays on experience. You don't really have experience in academia, not not real life experience, right. but you're, you're learning, you're researching, you're, you're getting history, you're getting context. Um, and in growing up, even before university, you know, in relation to, to stories like Native American culture, you're probably the victim of all the normal mythologies, you know, TV is shoveling at you or movies or books and all of that. Uh, probably half of it, there's some truth in it, and probably half of it, there's some nonsense, um, you know, create, created for certain parties' benefits. Um, so I, I suppose, as you know, growing up middle class in California, um, I, I was subject to all of that. Uh, I think academia was important in doing a little bit of a deeper dive into re research and sources and all of that. Um, and then <clears throat> um, I have always done artwork. So for me, the business of making things, uh, I always felt that, you know, making a building or a place or an interior, or for that matter, an object, in a way, it's a microcosm of everything embedded in the design of, let's say, a basketball is all kinds of cultural things, if you could see into it, and you could know enough about it, and you could unpack it. So it's never been a problem. I've never felt that, well, if I'm designing a chair, that, oh, gee, that's kind of narrow, and that's small, and you know, that really, that's not really relevant to um, larger and more important decisions. I, I consider those decisions are as important as uh, the qu quantum physicist, you know, or the astrophysicist contemplating, you know, how many billions of years, you know, things have been going on. You know, everything is, is space time and it's all related. Um, so yeah. I, 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 take, I take as a designer and, and an artist, you know, I take any charge as being universally important, and I try to throw as much attention to it uh, as I can. So I suppose that's that's some of kind of what I'm about. Yeah, there there's a uh, um, a deep uh, resonance to that statement within me. I would say <laughs> that is a weird mm, statement yeah. for me to say, or a weird sentence, but uh, that's the best I can describe it. That uh, yeah, that every single every single thing at any time in this experience is a uh, full encapsulation of both truth and relationship in my thinking that requires a dissection of those things to understand what you're actually dealing with and then that you know as clear as you can get on that truth to accommodate it in the design of a chair whatever uh, mm -hmm. is is just of, of such uh, importance if someone takes that really seriously i think it really comes through in design and in artwork uh and it and it has that ability to say what it's saying to pretty much anyone uh depending on how well that is done uh yeah and I, th I, I think that's right i think if you're the audience too looking or walking through a building or sitting on that chair or whatever you know um you could know nothing and appreciate it that would be fine but the more you could know the more you could unpack the more you would understand the kind of intersectionality of that thing to all other things, you know. So in, um, let me pull my, my uh, observations back. So you've given us a brief history of yourself. 
Uh, and that one of the things I, I really did find interesting in here is that you had Donald, Donald, and I'm not sure if I'm saying this last name right, Fixico? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the project's cultural, cultural and heritage advisor, shared, the design, shared with the design team the contrast of linear thinking and Western culture versus the holistic nonlinear ways of the natives, or as he calls it, a circular way of viewing the universe, whereas Western culture values land as a commodity, native cultures give spiritual value to it. Um, how did how did that get absorbed into your thinking and into your process, and how did it inform the decisions that you made in designing this building? Yeah, well, Don was a very important part of the team, Don Fixico, and he's a professor at Arizona State University, and he's a Native American. He's very articulate, and he was very helpful. Uh, but I would say that in addition to him, he, he led this thinking. It became clear the deeper we got into working with tribal leaders that you know, he was he was correct. He was describing a condition that is is and has been historically prevalent in the Native American mind largely. And that is that all things are connected, um, that um, things are not commoditized, so to speak. You know, so um, in terms yeah. of just under, understanding the history, uh, you know, uh, the ability for the American government, uh, uh, you know, with uh, the Indian Removal Act to like, swap out the, re the reservations, their native lands for territory in Oklahoma, well, that was disorienting. And then later with the Dawes Act in the late 1880s, when he said, okay, by the way, you've been here for a while. Now we're gonna chop all this land up. We're gonna decide who's a real Indian and who's not. And we're gonna give each real Indian X acres. And now you own this parcel. Uh, you know, that was totally antithetical right. to the way the Native Americans looked at land. Yeah. They looked at, land you know it's it's you know earth air wind and fire and uh these are the cosmic elements and they're imbued with spiritual kind of eternal values and all of a sudden you have a parcel well what's a parcel well the european yeah. settlers know what a parcel is a parcel is a figment of the capitalist system right that you can trade it's like a dollar bill one dollar yep. means a dollar of value a parcel means x whatever it's assigned in the it's marketplace. It's a unit. It's a unit of representation, you know. And they're going, no, wait, yeah. hold it. I don't, I don't get that, you know. And so over the course of the 19th century and then the first part of the 20th century, essentially many and most of these lands, these ownerships, these commodities left the hands of the natives and became owned by white settlers. And... Um, uh, so, so it, that's that's the kind of the platform for understanding uh, what it means to see the world and its physical attributes as a Native American versus a European white settler, um, and um, in terms of uh, how it affects us, it affects us in very fundamental ways. I don't I don't mean to jump to the punchline here, but um, you know, linear thinking, the idea of sequential procedures and methods aren't necessarily inherent to the native mind or mentality. And we're, we're designing a place that is above all other things is a staging ground for the native Americans to tell their own stories and how they think to share their way of being with everyone, with themselves and with everybody else. So we really had to back out of all of our normal, comfortable tools and think, okay, let's see. A door isn't a door, is it? Now, it's not something that's slightly, it's rectangular and slightly bigger than a human with a doorknob on one side and hinges on the other. That's not a door, right? That's a door that we've come to think of as a door, right? Uh, it's like using that's a peso in America. Yeah, 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 exactly. It defines there's a sail and a saddle and you're either in it or you're out of it. That's, that doesn't, that's not the right tool. So, and a ceiling. Well, a ceiling isn't flat, drain to slo slope to drain. That's not really what a ceiling is. A ceiling might want to be about the heavens, right? Rather than the water that's going to flow into, you know, a scupper and down a drain leader, right? And so each of these things, you kind of have to back out of everything you've learned. And fortunately, there was a lot of time on this project. I mean, it took, I said, I was quoted at one point saying, it's a project of a lifetime. Well, I mean that actually literally too. It was about half a lifetime of, of work. And uh, we had the time to sort of get with the program, lose what we had 
come to think of as the normal tools of design and adapt new tools through the dialogue with the natives. And Don Fixico was very much a part of that. As, as someone who comes from a linear thinking culture, if we can, you know, encapsulate it to some right. degree in that way, what was the most difficult thing to unlearn or to learn in interacting with a culture that thinks far differently? Um, I would say the hardest thing was the thing that is always hard, <laughs> frankly, when you have a, a multiple clients, multiple groups that you're serving, and that is the process. And it's always, it's different every time and it's hard to know how to do it, but it's how to build a consensus. And, you know, if you have one client, it's one person and that's what they want and you know how to do that thing. Well, then you kind of run in a straight line programmatically and in terms of developing the outcome. If you have 39 tribes that are all native, but, you know, they have all their own particular belief systems and sub belief systems. And one thinks of fire as a highly spiritual thing. Uh, and one thinks of fire as a ritual thing. And one thinks of fire as a thing for agriculture and one thinks of fire, you know, you, every conversation, particularly in the context of a symbolic architecture, every conversation <laughs> leads to multiple mm. interpretations and that's fine and that's necessary and it's good. But in the end, in order to build something, you have to gather your arms around that and come to a place where everybody agrees that, that their version is embedded in the thing that we're all doing. Uh, so it's consensus building is is the challenge. Uh, mm. And that's some of what took a long time to build this as well. On the client side of this process, was there a represent was there a representative that would do the bidding of each of the 39 countries that are <clears throat> uh, uh, tribes that you'd have to interact with in some way? Yeah, well, we had there, there were the tribes and then there were tribal leaders. And then there was a committee that represented them. So it was kind of, it was very broad pinnacle, but it was a pinnacle. <clears throat> and, um, and there was a Native American educational uh, authority, which kind of did a lot of that work to try to bring the tribes together. But we were also in all those meetings because we needed to, before you design something, you really have to program it. And in this case, as you know, Trent, we, we were first looking for a site, then we were evaluating the site, and then we were master planning the site for multiple events and things. And then we had located where we were going to build this building. And then we began to do the building. And uh, But to do the building, we had to program what are the ingredients around which the building is designed. So there were all these early stages before you really got to a pen on a paper or a mouse on a screen to really begin to design. Hmm. So... The uh, one thing that I had picked up in the kind of uh, uh, creative brief press release, however you want to call it, um, on the uh, First Americans Museum is that the native cultures viewed right angles as something that would trap the soul. And that's, to me, that's really, really interesting, primarily because of our common background of being trained as architects, thinking in very, uh, not graphic as in, this has violence in it, but graphic as in, when I think of things, I'm drawing them out in my head as a graphic representation, and they start to take forms uh, in my head as I think about them. And to think of something that is either linear or circular, but then to think of something as a right angle, the the natives took that and, and they had a, a, a very, uh, in a way, a visceral response to straight lines and right angles. And, and they felt that through their spirituality in some way. And I always wondered at the beginning of architecture school why there wasn't kind of a summary of shapes and the emotional responses that uh, they would elicit as almost a summary that you could use to design when in architecture school. I was kind of thought, well, you know, a domed roof is going to kind of pull you to the center and one that uh, kind of like Dulles Airport, it, it pushes you out to the sides. And 
to hear this kind of thing coming from a native culture, uh, you know, right angles can trap the soul. Like, that's really interesting to me, but that's about all I, I know of it. Did they, did, did you ever get to absorb that thinking through your interactions with the culture at all and, and come to an understanding of that? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting what you're saying, uh, you know, just a study of formal language and patterns with regard to their emotional, likely emotional effects, but also their cultural effects. You know, many of us, we've had a lot of interaction the last few decades with Asia. So we know there's a thing called feng shui, right? Positive feng shui and positive chi and negative chi. And there's a whole cultural lineage as to how space is used with regard to their belief systems. Well, the same is true, but different with the Native American. And yes, uh, they believe the soul is one with the universe. So anything that is not expansive or circumferential is limiting. So what could be more limiting than a box with four 90 degree corners? You know, that's pretty limiting. Hmm. And, it, and it, it epitomizes or symbolizes <clears throat> the essence of the difference in cultures. You know, uh, if you go to Sumeria or Mesopotamia and look at uh, ziggurats, they're on a rectangular grid. And then you go to Egypt and the temples are on a grid and then Greece and then the Roman Republic. And, you know, you get to right, uh, right. Carti Descartes and Cartesian rectangles and geometries. And we can go on and on, but we've inherited that as a monolith. And uh, mm -hmm. it's it's like like we're learning in astrophysics. We're making assumptions that allow us to move through life, but those assumptions are not universal and they don't speak to everything. They're just functionally helpful in the present moment, right? And then you can discover right. another culture, in this case, Native American cultures, and they go, oh, no, 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 you know, we don't, that's not what we do. And here, let us explain what we do. And um, right. so it's very, it's very enlightening and uh, a lot of growth involved in that, you know? Yeah, that that's that's really interesting to me, just because I I gravitate towards uh, a high degree of minimalism, and I and I don't really emotionally uh, respond well to a building or living space that's highly, um, uh, let's see, how would you describe it? Uh, if if things are extremely minimal, right angles, straight walls. Uh, but then also a lot of glass like that. That's just like my happy place and music to my ears. And it's like I if I had the choice, I'd, you know, live in a space that felt very much like a white walls, concrete floor and glass museum, which is remarkably how my house looks, you know, and then I'll have a very <laughs> controlled area of a very strong focal point of art. And so it allows for everything else to be under control and then have this one area of contemplation that is this chaos in a way and everything else is on lockdown and i i don't know what it is about my genetics and my culture that led me to to having that disposition uh but a lot of the things that have i've found wrong in my life uh came through an understanding of uh, realizing that those very rigid ways of interacting with things uh, leaves you coming up short in, in many ways and having to struggle with that lack of control to embrace it, to find uh, peace, which is interesting. I don't, I don't know how to directly connect those things, but reading the cultural values that you guys outlined uh, from the culture that you were working with to produce this building were things that were enlightening that I have found uh, at a foundational philosophical level to be enlightening for me, which is, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. You're more than welcome. Um, you know, uh, I, just to be clear, I don't believe that if someone thinks that a perfect white space, it's rectangular with a glass wall and the North, and a work of art on the wall or on the floor, or whatever, if they think that gives them peace and it resonates most what they want. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that's wrong. I don't think oh, no. one cosmology is superior to another. There are reasons why we 
feel this way and many of us feel yeah. differently. Uh, that's all fine. Um, you know, but, uh, but, but everything comes at a price, right? When we make right. those decisions and inherit those systems that give us peace or satisfaction, we have excluded certain other options, which may carry other qualities and benefits. And we made that decision, maybe explicitly or implicitly, but we've made it. Um, but it's always expansive. If it, you know, design, if anything, in its best form is about learning stuff, right? So uh, you're not you're not there to like tell the client. Well, I mean, there are architects and rather well known ones who do. Oh, here I'm here now, and you can go away. I'm going to give you what I do. But we don't think about it that way, you know. We think about it as a gro growth experience, an educational experience by being allowed into somebody else's life and beginning to understand that, so we can. Uh, create a physical metaphor of that thing that we're learning about, you know, and that makes us yeah. useful, useful. I know that sounds like a humble word, but yeah, useful. Well, I, th I think humility is such an incredibly uh, powerful thing for one's growth, because if I were to think that, you know, my, my straight walls and glass and concrete and one, one piece of artwork, everyone needs to do that. That would, you know, that would just be absurdly, uh, linear right. <laughs> you know it's like right. everyone must do that. and now but at the same time to admit that this works for me and where i incorporate more of the circular way of thinking is in this place of honor within my residence the place mm -hmm. where i interact with more of a circular reasoning is is more of a contemplative place where i allow it as a emotional intellectual exercise limited to this that is of a place it it, it is a it I've made it a thing of utmost value for me to focus on, but it is mm -hmm. not how I live my life day to day. I live my life day to day in a far more regimented uh, process, but, uh, but in some ways understand that that, um, that aspect of my life has to be accommodated and it's extremely valuable. And I probably realize that because of the lack of it in the rest of my life. Not to say that that lack is a negative, it's just that I control it out of the rest of my life and put it in a place where I can learn from it rather than be degraded by it. And not to say that it is degrading, but for me, if I exist in that kind of a thing, it degrades me, which is just respect of the individual, I think, which is humility, yeah. which if you can give that to others is so important. I think that's right, and, and it is rare. And um, I think I think Westerners. I'm going to make a gross generalization here. Westerners like us, you and me, and some others, um, have tended to use architecture to encapsulate their view of the world. Whether it's a cathedral in Europe, which embodies the liturgy, or whether it's a modern museum, which is white and clean and empty, to uh, to accentuate the spirituality of a work of art in that space and focus our attention, uh, we use architecture as a tool to define that. And I think that's fine. That's the tradition, one of the traditions we're on. I think the Native American has never seen his or her habitation. Even the word architecture is awkward, you know. Uh, yeah. they, they are more humble and modest in their habitations because their architecture is the architecture of the universe, the cosmology. It's the sun and the moon and the rotation of the earth and the herds and the meadows and the fields. And the, you know, that's their architecture now. Um, so once again, we sort of described, you know, these two opposite trends. And so you have to figure out how to embody those things, that, that universal architecture, that hugely inclusive vision of architecture into a building, right? I mean, it requires some humility, I think, right? Yeah, the, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to realize is that the, the, the different cultural values that would be uh, held in, in different, differing degrees of tightness uh, in the Western uh, value system, it's kind of establish your boundaries and and then progress you know and and that would make uh your your residence or your home far more of an uh taking far more attention in its permanence 
and its uh, finality in a way where a more nomadic uh, culture that follows herds and the rhythms of the seasons, your, your domicile, your home, or whatever, is, is going to be far more of a lesser attribute of your existence, if that's the right way of saying that, right. and, and your focus yeah. becomes more so your <clears throat> presence in what you're doing. And there's so much to benefit from that. And there's also so much to benefit from the other, but the negative sides of each are something to be considered and the positives are something to be considered, not to say that one's better or worse. That's, that, right. that's interesting. That's that, and, and I think yeah. they probably have a, a fuller spiritual and community experience were they not to have been so deeply uh, disturbed by the, you know, this other culture permeating over the land. I would imagine there's there's probably a much higher degree of peace and connectedness within their experience that a more Western society might lack, uh, especially an American Western society, which is even uh, more refined down to like let's just make money and progress compared to like European culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, you know I just continue that thought. Um, I think that. Uh, the highest aspiration we could have for a building like First Americans Museum would be that it would help to re bring those communities of tribes back together around common things, right? So to re help them re knit their community, uh, communities. And so what do you look to? You look to all those outward uh, cosmological elements. You design a building that the sun rises in the east and in the equinox, it actually throws the sun right down through the middle to, from the east to the west through the entrance, right? You right. create a promontory, the top of which marks uh, the high point of the summer solstice, and you put a tunnel through a piece of it so that the winter solstice, it marks, it becomes a Stonehenge. It begins the building, whatever else it does, you know, wherever the bathrooms are, where they deliver the mail, it does a whole bunch of things that, that, that focus us and hopefully the native tribal people on the things that were always important to them that were always part of their culture. And those are natural elements. It, I was watching something recently that, that pointed out how a lot of the ancient cultures in, in some way might have been putting a timestamp on their building by how it was oriented. Because if you go back, you know, thousands of years long enough, you start to realize that these were oriented towards the heavens through stars, constellations, and everything else. But that mm -hmm. just over the passage of significant time, the alignment is not um, correct because the universe has changed. But the idea isn't that they aligned it once and it would be forever in alignment. They were more so saying this is the period in time in, in which we built this potentially saying something to future generations as just, uh, you know, kind of how we will put a cornerstone in and put the date on it, you know, referencing the year of our Lord, 18, whatever, you know, um, mm -hmm. that that's really interesting to me that the, the, there's this idea of you can mark when in time something was made by how you orient it to the universe. Yeah, that is interesting. I think the corollary in Native American uh, culture might be, uh, you know, they, they always interact in their habitations with nature. Um, and so, you know, mound buildings along the Mississippi would be there because the rivers would flood. So they, they're in awareness of these seasonal events. Um, tribes that followed herds and hunted herds had, you know, teepees that, uh, dwellings that were hides and poles, right? So they could move them and follow the, the movement of the game, right? Um, mm -hmm. They're always sort of interacting, even as I say, architecture with a small a, you know, um, they're interacting with nature and, um, and they're very mindful of the seasons because they're tracking the movement of the sun and that tells them, you know, when the colder seasons will be there and when the hunting seasons and the calving seasons happen and all of that. So, you know, these are vestigial yeah. things, but very important to them in the way they think. Yeah, yeah. Well, in in designing the, the buildings for this this project, for this site, for this culture, uh, what uh, 
what's what's your retrospective look at it now what is the 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 deep satisfaction the things you maybe wish uh you could have done differently if possible uh what what's the retrospective now on this on this project that it's complete well it, it took me and it took all of us, the team, 25 years to <laughs> wow. think it up and design it. Try to, it might take me 25 years to answer your question, but um, yeah. <laughs> basically, uh, you know, it's it's quite gratifying. It, it was it was not easy to build uh, because it was it's very idiosyncratic building, and you know the construction community is used to doing buildings with replicating floors and their rectangles and roofs do roof things and walls do wall things. You know, you don't right. tilt a glass wall and you certainly don't do a, you know, a hybrid arc shaped form, spherical form out of glass. You, know, you don't do these things. So it was very um, challenging to build, uh, to create, but um, uh, it did come out well. And uh, I think the, the satisfaction, again, it's going to sound like I'm repeating myself, but is the satisfaction that always comes at the end of a project when it seems to have gone well, which is the clients, in this case, the Native Americans have sort of overtaken it and are using it vigorously for their own purpose. So it seems to have resonated with them or most of them. Uh, it's very busy. It's very active. There are a lot of things that happen. There's an enormous um, sort of family center, uh, discovery center for kids. And I think it's really important for kids to know what their legacy is uh, they may find themselves growing up as youngsters in a, a world which doesn't really make clear to them what their own background is. And that could be problematic as a young child trying to get to adulthood. And this hopefully nails some of that down, gives them a broader understanding of how important uh, their background is. And they really are the founders of this continent, not the people who came later. And to be, on be honest about all that. And... Um, so I, I think I think the fact they're using it so vigorously is the satisfaction. Um, and you know, when you do a building, you always learn. I mean, physically, constructively, from things you try to do: a curved wall, a sloped ceiling, a glass uh, wall. So we learn a lot of technical things. But I don't think we're uh, displeased about anything. I think we'd like another commission that would allow us to pursue some of those things uh, even more extremely you know, into the yeah. future. So, well, it, it's a, is a really interesting project from the, the cultural positions that the, the totality of, of this thing pulls from both the linear mindset, circular mindset coming together, to represent, uh, uh, a, you know, a vast, uh, array mm. of cultures within native populations. Uh, the the use of the space that you find how much time have you been able to spend at the actual museum or hear from people who who've been able to spend quite some time there how is it is is it a is a really intense usage by specifically native populations or is it a mix of use from Oklahoma City bunch of westerners checking it out or like what's the what's the usage like of the space these days yeah, the, the majority of users are from Oklahoma and thereabouts, and the majority of users are Native Americans. But there's there's a high degree of tourists as well and uh, non-natives. Uh, but what's interesting and needs to be said is that uh, Native Americans uh, have been there so long and settlers, European based settlers, have now been there so long, 150 plus years that you find the Native American population, even the 39 tribes aside, which suggests diversity, there's a huge amount of diversity and hybridization within the natives themselves. There are people who are native, 100% native, and their fathers and children are native. There are people who've intermarried over generations, and um, you know they are maybe bankers or accountants and, and work in whatever, right, in downtown Oklahoma, and you talk to them and you know, they're Choctaw or they're whatever, they, they have tribal connections, native connections. So um, it's not, the borders are not clear at all. So you might have somebody showing up in a suit and they're having a reception 
for a corporation, but you know, three quarters of the people have native roots in their background in some way. So mm -hmm. it's a very hybrid population. Well, it's, it's a, it's a really great project. I'm really, uh, really, really, uh, honored that I'm, I'm able to talk to, first of all, the, the principles of such a, a you know, a, a, well to do is not the right word, but accomplished and respected uh, design firm on a on a project that um, for me has specific interest in that it it delves into in in many ways the culture and mythology of of ancient cultures and and pulls a design out of that. That's just to me that's that's uh, such an interesting conversation. So thank you very much for uh, taking the time to both uh, for your bill and yourself today for talking with me about that um it's it's really uh, a great thing to to see the humility and the coming together and and the grace and allowing from from both cultures uh accepting that the that there's uh, a, a pull from each side to to move forward that that is a, a good example for us as uh, americans these days to pull from so <laughs> I think, thank you I so think, much yes, for I think it, your time. Thank you, Trent. It's, it's timely, I think. It was a wonderful opportunity, and we thank you for your interest in all that work. Thanks so much. Well, thank you for, for doing this. Thank you for uh, taking the time to talk. Thank you for doing a great job on this, and I really hope to be able to take my family by there one of these days and to experience the museum because it looks really incredible. I've just watched a few things on mound building and everything else that, that I'd Man, if you, I wonder if you have to get reservations to go there on the summer solstice, I imagine, to be able to get in that one spot <laughs> to take that photo, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's on, it's on the trip to Ventura, so you get, it's a necessary stop. Oh, oh, absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, Scott, thank you so much for your time, and uh, thank you uh, to Bill as well for earlier taking the time to talk to us on this uh, really great project, and thanks again.